name this morning, isn't it? My Lord. That song reminds me of revival times back in the South. Oh, when you would see people shouting and dancing under the power of the Holy Spirit. And when lives would be riveted and changed and transformed. A time, I think, sometimes has gone by when we knew how to really just worship Him with everything that was in us. We would just abandon ourselves to the worship of the living God. Kind of like it's going to look when we get to heaven, when, when there's angels running and crying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And then we join in with a heavenly choir, I am redeemed. A song they cannot sing. Oh, I'm longing for a day when we begin to praise Him like we used to. When we abandon ourselves and say, God, you are worthy. You are worthy of my praise and I'm going to worship you with everything that's in me. You can be seated this morning. Oh, Jesus, what a beautiful name. I tell you, if you knew the power of just saying Jesus, if you knew what the Bible said about that name, it said every knee should bow and every tongue confess. That means when you're under attack and you don't know what else to do, Jesus is a good thing to say. Because I tell you, your, 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 your struggles can bow under that name. I want to say this morning that our worship team did us extremely proud last week. I was so uh, thankful for them. They operated under an anointing of the Holy Spirit uh, like I've not seen them operate before. And we probably had one of the best retreats, adult retreats, that we've had in a number of years. I mean, people were delivered and uh, marriages were healed and people were healed and restoration took. It was amazing. In fact, I was getting uh, uh, information yesterday about all that had happened and uh, people were calling people that they hadn't seen in years and saying, I forgive you. Will you please forgive me? I'm sorry. And all kinds of things like that happening. And that's a testimony that God was in the house. And um, I appreciate the 25 from this local body that went. Thank you so much for traveling and, and going there. My, we had such a beautiful facility. It was awesome to be there in that place and to... Um, just see the working uh, of the Lord. Uh, all week, um, as I have been preparing for this message, every time I would think about it, I would sense a closeness uh, with the Lord. So this morning, I believe that God has prepared a Kairos moment for some of you here today. Now, a Kairos moment is a time when the Holy Spirit draws near to do a special work. So I want you this morning, and I challenge you to listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit and to let Him minister to you and to let Him change you as only He can. David put it this way, and if you would do that this morning, I believe that God would do a miracle in your life. David said, search me, O God, and see... If there is a wicked way in me. David was saying to God, God, I don't know if anything is awry in my life. I am unaware of it, but obviously something is out of place. So search me, God, and try me. And see if anything in my life is out of place. And I want to apologize to, to those of you who went to retreat because I'm going to use a portion of that sermon this morning, a short little portion of it in this. So bear with me for a few minutes. And I want to take my time today and I want this to sink into you. But I feel a tremendous anointing. I, tr I feel that God has a Kairos moment and I am afraid that sometimes we miss that moment with God because we don't pay attention to what God is trying to do. 
or because we are so self-consumed with ourselves, or because we feel that everything is all right. That would brink on the verge of being perfect. And I don't know if any of us in this room has reached that place yet of perfection. I believe that we are saying to God, God, will you please come in among me and begin to touch me that I can begin to look at you and look at others the way you want me to. I know for myself I am asking the Lord to let me view people through his eyes. Because too often we look through our own eyes and our own eyes are a little bit prejudiced and unjust and judgmental. But I want to look through God's eyes. Please, Holy Spirit, let me do that. The Bible is the best self-improvement course ever devised. According to scriptures, our days are not accidental or incidental. We are not random or rudderless souls drifting through life. How many of you feel sometimes like that, that you are just drifting through life? You're just moving through. Well, you're not. We have a heavenly Father who orders our steps and ordains our stops. We are challenged by our stops. Aren't we? You might want to ask you what the stop sign is all about. Our Heavenly Father who orders our steps and ordains our stops. Who ordains our time and assigns our tasks. You have been assigned a task and many of us fail to recognize and get a hold of the task that God has given us and fulfill it all the days of our life. That means if you are called to preach or to teach or to play music or to sing or to do anything else, that is a lifetime assignment that you never can retire from. I will never retire from preaching because that is my assigned task. All the days of my life I must do this. I have to grow in it. I have to mature in it. I have to follow Scripture. But I can detour from my assigned task by my life, by how I live. I can detract from my assignment. In other words, my lifestyle can be a stop in my forward motion. Our life can put in a stop. Some of the stops in life God has ordained because we're going too fast. We're not waiting on Him. But some of the stops in our life are brought about by how we live our life. He orders our steps. He ordains our time and assigns our tasks. He equips us to do His will and His work in us that is pleasing to Him. This means that the Lord designed a wonderful tailor-made life with exact specifications. We are God's handiwork. Ephesians 2 and 10, let's look at that for a moment. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You were predestined to live for God when you started serving God. That doesn't mean that God chooses who's going to serve Him and who doesn't serve Him. Some folks believe that. That is not true. You are a free will creature and you get to choose. The Bible says whosoever will. That means anybody and everybody is welcome. For we are His workmanship created. This is Paul talking to the church. This is me talking to you, reading Paul's words. We, work, we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
Do you see the ordination of your life there? Your personality belongs to you alone. But your personality can be altered by sin. Now, how many of you have ever seen someone in your life that was a quiet person by nature? Mix alcohol and they were a loud mouth drunk. That is an example of something altering your personality. And if you're not careful, we can allow sin to come in and alter our personality. The personality that God has given us. God has given each of us a personality and it is yours alone. No one else can have it. So stop imitating others and be who you are. Help me preach, God. Your calling and gifts are unique. Your background is singular. Your legacy can be achieved by no one else on earth but you. You have a legacy from God and no one can achieve it but you. What that means is if you don't achieve your legacy, it will not be achieved. Do you understand the power of that statement? You have a legacy from God, a legacy of holiness, a legacy of your family, all of these things. And if you don't fulfill that, if you allow sin to dominate your life, you will never fulfill your assignment, your calling and your gifts, your uniqueness. Your legacy, nobody else on earth can achieve that. God ordains it for you and you alone. I know that is hard for some of us to grasp, but I'm going to prove that to you through Scripture. It is hard for us to understand that the legacy that God has given us, nobody else can do it but me. I must fulfill that legacy, and I have a road map and a direction that gives me a compass to live by. It is God's Word. Not taken out of context. Preached and taught and read in context. There is a special blueprint for your life with no other name on the page. You need to know that. And I'm going to show you that. I'm going to show you the wonder of that creation in just a few minutes. Your strengths, your struggles. You ever looked at somebody and said, you know... I wish I, I wish I was like, they don't seem to struggle with much, and I struggle with this. That God ordained that struggle for you. Why, why do I need to struggle with this, Lord? I don't know. You might be like the Apostle Paul with just a little bit of arrogance in you, and you need a little thorn to come alongside of you to keep you humble and obedient to God. That just might be a reason. I don't know. And I won't speculate, but I know Paul had one. There's a whole lot of things that people speculate about what Paul's thorn was, and I'm not going to speculate because the Bible don't say I'm going to ask Paul or God when I get there, or it may not matter. Now I'd sure like to know. I mean, I've studied and researched and read everybody's opinion, and if there wasn't 40 different opinions, I might settle on one, but there's so many opinions about what it was, I can't settle on anything. But I don't know and the Bible don't say, so we'll just leave it. But I want to tell you something right now. Your strengths and your struggles. And situations are not a hit and miss. The strengths you have are there because God put them there. The struggles you have are there because God put them there. Sometimes your struggles keeps you on the right trail with God. Keeps you from going off track. Keeps you from getting in places that you should not ought to be and doing things you should not ought to do. Some of you need to listen to this sermon today and allow God to begin to do something in your life. You are not fulfilling your potential. You're drifting through life and going through life and getting by and shucking and jiving. And God's going to call you to account for that on Judgment Day. God is going to call us to that, folks. All your days are designed in advance before any of them appears on the calendar. And I can prove that in the Scripture. And I'm going to do that. Because I know some of you are looking at me like, that boy done lost his mind. And God longs to fulfill His plan in your life just as fully as He wants His will done in heaven. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
That means God wants his will in your life done. We make that too broad a picture. We paint too broad a picture with that brush. We sweep the sky and say his will on earth is everybody to be saved like they are in heaven. But I'm here to tell you, you're a unique creature and God created you special and unique. And he wants his will in your life to be fulfilled. But we miss his will. I hope you know by now or are gathered by now that you are a unique people or a unique person. There is no one else like you. And I want to say that I love you very much today. I really care about you more than than I thought I ever would care about people other than my family. I, I, I just want you to know that. But before we can become what God wants us to be, we must discover who we are in Him. You have to be in Him to find your destiny. You have to be walking in Him to fulfill your destiny. All kinds of things come into play in your life that hinder you from fulfilling the destiny of God. Most of the things that come into your life is sin. There are a lot of people who do not know their identity in Christ. This is because so many things come into our lives. Many are brought by the devil and we never ever get past them. You need to listen to this here. They tend to come and dominate who we are. For example, hurts. Let's look at that for a moment. Physical, mental, and emotional hurts. We begin to wear that. We take those garments and we slip them on. We slip them on like jackets. Some of us are wearing so many clothes we can't do anything. We're wearing so many different types of garments. We've got them slipped on over us. Disappointments. Sometimes we're disappointed in our marriage, our children, our careers, our church. The list can go on. You understand what I'm saying. I can't name them all. Unforgiveness, fear, low self-esteem, to name a few. These distractions of the devil pull us from our assigned mission on earth. Hebrews calls them weights and sins and tells us plainly in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, what to do with a weight. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Do you understand the power of those words? You are surrounded by a cloud of witness. Let us lay aside every weight and sin which does so easily ensnare us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the Of the throne of God. Look at the power of that verse of scripture. Let us lay aside everything that snares us. Let us at some point in our life. At some place in your life. At some time on the frame that that you are living. Let us begin to take and lay aside the garments. That's what it calls them. I'm going to use this little garment. That's a baby jacket. But they come in all sizes. And then I'm going to grab a big jacket over here. They come in all sizes. They come in all sizes, all sizes of stuff that we got stuffed on us. And the Bible calls for us to do something very simple. And we can't get the simplicity of that verse of Scripture. It tells me to lay them aside. You are waiting for God to take them off of you. Can I tell you that God is not going to do the job that He assigned to you to do? What He told you and gave you ability to do, God is counting on you doing it. He said for you, the writer of Hebrews said, let us lay aside. In other words, let us begin to take hold of those jackets of hurts and disappointments and unforgiveness and fear and low self esteem and let us begin to lay them down and to pull them off and to leave them behind us as we walk forward and then you will become the unique person that God ordains you to be let us lay aside everything that hinders me listen some of you have been in relationships that have just about destroyed you some of you have had your heart broken by love and on and on and a lot of other things Some of you right now, your parents are giving you more turmoil and more torment than you know what to do with. 
And you're wearing it around and carrying it around and it occupies more of your conversation and more of your thought time than it ought to. The Bible says lay it down at the feet of Jesus and when he takes up your cause, he will make a way where there seems to be no way. We say things like, I don't see how this could ever be fixed. Jesus, Jesus, what a beautiful name. I see a, a silver lining in every cloud. I see the ability of God to work in my life when I let him. But when we walk around declaring with our mouth the powerful creature you are, and some of you have not figured out how powerful you are, that at your very word you create things. Good and bad. <clears throat> Life and death situations. Here lately in my own personal life, I've got to the point that every thought that goes through my mind, I, I filter it through the Scripture. And I'll say, now, Lord, that's not, that's not in your word. That is not the way to act. That's not the way to think. None of those things are supposed to be in me. And I take that thing captive right now, and I bring it under the subjections of the Word of God. Now, you get 60,000 thoughts a day. 45,000 are negative. That's just scientific proof. You can look it up on YouTube, Google, and all the other places. That we just, our minds are designed that way. That's a lot of thinking. Our minds are just whirling like this. Our mind is a sophisticated computer, and we only use about 2% of our brain. That's all we use. Unfortunately, because see, we got to go back to when we were created, when things were perfect and we used all of our mind. We're going to go back to that. Oh, yes, we are. But when God put that mind and brain in you, he put it in you in the Garden of Eden. And we're functioning with it in the Garden of Sin right now. Somebody help me preach today. So who are you? Psalms 139 gives us a glimpse of what God thinks about you. For you formed my inward parts. This is David writing. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. And that my soul knows right well. This is one of the greatest passages in literature about the miracle of human conception and birth. David declared that God is present at conception and birth because we are made in His image. And He has a special purpose for each person. Every baby that is born, God is standing right there. These children walking around in here, you think you were the only one in the room, Daddy and Mama? When that baby was born, God was standing there because he had a purpose for that child. Now, what are you going to do in raising that child and giving them their purpose? Are you going to raise them like you? Or are you going to try to raise them, that child like him? God formed you. Not only did God design our bodies, but he planned and determined our days. In other words, how long we will live on planet Earth. But if you live foolishly, you might die before the time God has de designed for you. So don't waste your days worrying over things that you cannot change, allowing all of this stuff to crowd out God in your destiny. Jeremiah 1 and 5 said, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. This is God speaking to Jeremiah and telling him that and making Jeremiah write it. <laughs> you know, we're so, we're so afraid to let God speak to us. I mean, think of the power of that scripture. Jeremiah wrote this about his own self. We sometimes think that somebody else is writing this. Jeremiah's writing this. It's not somebody else. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you, ordained you a prophet to the nations. Do you see your foreordination here? Your plan that God has for you before you were ever born, before you were ever thought of, before you were ever conceived? God, we sometimes think that God don't know who we are until we're, until we're out here. God knows who you are when you're in your father's loins. 
When there's been no transfer of seed. When there's been no, when there's been nothing. God knew who I was before my mom and daddy ever met. He knew what I would be. The thing he was counting on was me getting to the place that I would become what he wanted me to become. That I would be, and I, I'm a work in progress. He's still working on me. I'm not arrived anywhere yet. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I have a plan for you. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. I have plans for you. But because you have free will, we have the power to disregard God's plan for our lives because of all of the stuff we drag around. Some of you ought to look behind you for the U-Haul that you're pulling. As you go through life, you're pulling a U-Haul full of stuff that ought not to be there. There is much more to all of us that we are allowing to come forth. There's a whole lot more in you that you're not allowing God to bring out of you. That he wants to bring out of you. You are not achieving the destiny that God wants for you. It is time, church, to lay aside to abandon everything that hinders us and drags us down. For years... From the age of 19 to the age of 33, I drug around a spirit. Don't suck all the air out of the room. Leave some for me to breathe. I drug around a spirit of unforgiveness. I wore that thing like a badge. Now, I could forgive you, and I could forgive you, and I could forgive you, and I could do all that, but there was just some things I just could not get over. My dad was a thing I wouldn't forgive. I drug that around from 19 years old when I got saved till I was 33 years old when God told me I wasn't going to heaven. Talk about an aha moment. That was an aha moment for me. And it brought about immediate change. Let me assure you, it brought about immediate change. This morning, I greet you in the name that is above every name by position, you got to get this, by position and power. Do you know that God's name is above every name by position and power? Simply saying Jesus. That song that we sang, Jesus, what a beautiful name. Sometimes all you can say is Jesus because every knee will bow and every tongue confess. Every problem I have, every thought I have, everything that's about me, if I will say the name of Jesus, it will bow at that name. Who is the author and the finisher of our faith? I just read it. Who was and is and is to come. That at the name mention of his name, every knee should bow. Everything that's on the earth, in the earth, and under the earth. You need to get that. We misquote that scripture. The Bible says everything that is above, on, and beneath. Angels, man, and devil. Heaven, earth, and hell will all bow before him. Who the Bible declares about him that all things were made by him. And without him was nothing made that was made. Everything was made by him. That's your creator. Did you know that all the other animals were formed by the spoken word? God said, let the oceans teem with fish. How many's read that besides me? In other words, he just said, let it be in all the fish that we catch in the ocean. That halibut that I love so much. Catfish. All of that stuff just started swimming in the water. But when it came to you, God designed you specially. He came down out of heaven and with his own hand, he formed you out of the dust of the ground and breathed into you. He made you distinct from all other creatures and all other people. Every one of you in this room have a different set of fingerprints. And you know what? God didn't do that so that... The FBI would have a way of getting you if you got in trouble. God didn't do that so the FBI would have a record of who you are. So we could do background checks on you. He did that to let you know how unique you are in 7 billion people. You are unique. How many of you have ever thought about that? Nobody in this room has ever thought about that. I ponder crazy things, I guess, when I'm in my study. 
When I'm walking out in the field, I ponder crazy things like that. I'm trying to, trying to recognize who I am in Him. He gave me that uniqueness so that I would know that I was unique and so that the whole world would know that there's nobody got the same fingerprints as Frank Smith. There are people who have my same, have my same name. Did you know there's people who have the name Franklin G. Smith? That is crazy. One time I was applying for a loan and there's this guy named Franklin G. Smith who was born in Arkansas, same as me, whose social security number is one number off from me. He calls me a lot of trouble. I was so thankful that he's six foot tall and black. <laughs> Hallelujah. First time in my life I wanted to be short. That guy caused me a lot of havoc. When it came to credit, he said, you know, you got, I said, no, that ain't me. You run the number wrong. You got one number wrong. Please recheck that social security number. Because if you're from the south, your social security number starts with 432. And so, you know. There it was. When we understand that he drew you on the ground, it indicates that he took time to design you as a unique individual. Extremely special. He gave you a distinctive set of fingerprints. He gave you a distinct personality. He did all of this. And no one else can accomplish what God has assigned for you to do. Too many people try to do what other people do. What God has assigned other people to do. Why don't you just do what God's assigned you to do? You know, we want to be like this one, and we want to be like that one, and we want to be like the other one. We see somebody, and we want to be like them. Be like you. You can't do what they can do. No matter how hard you try, no matter what imitation you come up with, you cannot do what God has assigned someone else to do. We spend more time trying to do that, and that's why we miss so much of our assignments. People try to do what God has assigned to others. Sometimes it's out of necessity because they will not take their role in the body. But sometimes it's out of jealousy because we want to be them. Will you help me preach today? Look at the scripture with me. Look at Genesis chapter 1 verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him male and female. He created them. Now, sometimes we want to think that God did not create uh, the female uh, in his image, but he did. The male and the female are made in God's image. Very special. His DNA was transferred to you at creation. DNA. Let me tell you about DNA. DNA makes each living creature unique. DNA along with instructions. Your DNA has instructions in it. Those instructions say how tall you're going to be, what color your skin's going to be. And I, for the life of me, I cannot figure out why people on planet Earth fight over what color somebody's skin is. That is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of in my life is to be upset with somebody because of their skin color. And it's just simply the DNA that God put in you. Did you know that God is a diverse God? He is a God of all people, so he has to have all races. And we fuss about all that stuff needlessly. Lord, we have spent hundreds of years in the world discussing that and never fulfilling the destiny God has for us. Wouldn't it be wonderful we would quit that? Yes, it would be wonderful we would quit that. You missed a good time to say, yes, pastor, it would be wonderful. Let's do it again. Yes, pastor, that would be wonderful if we would quit that foolishness. The DNA, along with instructions it contains, is passed from the adult organism to their offspring during reproduction. It was predestined what I was going to look like when I was born from the man called Hubert Franklin Smith. I was going to be such a height and such a build and all of those things. That DNA was put there. Key word for us is instructions. You came with an instruction manual, folks, and a living guide, the Holy Spirit, if we would let him. That means that when God created man, when he bent over the balcony of heaven and breathed into your nostrils, his DNA was forever transferred to you. It is in you. And we live beneath the DNA that was passed to us. That means you're very powerful by design. Our DNA contains instructions needed to develop, survive, and reproduce. 
We can do all of those things, spiritually speaking. All key words there, develop, survive, and reproduce. What does that mean? It means you came with instructions. Inside you is a God desire to connect and to know the will of your Father. It means you have the capacity to love and to care for others like God does. It means if you allow the Holy Spirit, the instructions for your life will be laid out for you. It's easy to, in easy to follow steps. Why do we make that so challenging? Stay with me another few minutes and I'll finish this. Sin has altered our DNA a little bit, but it did not eliminate it. Adam may have lost that authority in the garden, but the second man, Adam, Jesus Christ, regained all of the authority and reestablished the power and the DNA in you to reproduce, to survive, and to overcome. But you've got to take hold of that. It is difficult for us to grasp this because we think we cannot achieve such a goal. Yet the scripture says that's exactly what we're supposed to do. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he made, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Some folks quote that scripture out of context, but we are the righteousness of God. What does that mean? That means Christ who did no sin was made sin for us that we might become his, his righteousness through the blood of Jesus. It means that the sins that are forgiven, the ones that I ask him to forgive me, are no longer held against me. And I have the right to all the Bible describes about me. We have inherited spiritual power. It has been passed to us by our Heavenly Father. For example... If you go to the zoo and you see a, or go to a, watch a television program about nature and you see a, a lion and you see a baby lion. Now, all the DNA of the father is in that baby lion. Would you agree with that? But that baby lion can't chase down its own prey right now. That baby lion can't fight off its attackers right now. That baby lion can't even roar right now. All that baby lion can do is lay in the shadow of his father. But let me tell you, when that lion grows up, all of the DNA that is in the father is in the son. And it can run and chase its prey. It can do all of those things. It can defeat its enemy. It can do all of those things. But the DNA was there all the time. God's DNA is in you to be more powerful than you think you are. To do exploits and to do things. We see, Bi- we see Bible- people in the Bible doing exploits. How many's read where they did exploits? How many's ever read where a man outran a team of horses, four horses, drawing a chariot, and he outran them for about 13, between 13 and 25 miles? How many's ever read that story? You talk about a long distance runner, that's a long distance runner. The Bible said he just hiked up his clothes and stuck it in his, in his belt that he wore and just outran a chariot drawn by horses. Thir- any, you know, I, I read it, I studied that, did some research on that, and some said 13, some said 25, some said 40. So I said, well, I don't know. I know he ran a long way. If you outrun a team of horses to the end of the street down there, that's pretty good. I mean, I'm just saying, that's pretty supernatural if you do that. Well, we can't do that. That was Elijah. Why can't you do that as God a respecter of persons? I don't think right now we need to outrun a team of horses, but there are things we ought to be doing. We ought to be telling the gospel. We ought to be laying hands on the sick. We ought to be casting out devils. We ought to be seeing things happen. We ought to be able to, to have our, a marriage that God is pleased with instead of fighting and bickering and fussing all the time. We ought to be able to raise some godly children. But we don't raise godly children. You know why we don't raise godly children? Because we're not godly. That's not the only reason. Sometimes they make choices on their own because they are free will creatures. But they're going to take a lot of their they're going to take a lot of their cue from you, parent. A lot of their cue comes from you. Oh, let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. Philippians four thirteen says, "I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me." We were designed with an incredible power to do all the Bible says we can do. We struggle with this because we do not have the connection that we need to have with the Creator. But the DNA is still there with instructions on how to use it. 
We should be doing what our Father told us to do. In fact, the Bible declares that we should in John chapter 14, verse 12 through 14. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. Now, how many of you believe that? Not many in here believe that. It's a great, it's a great saying. It's great to read. But we're scared to death to run up to someone's demon possessed and cast a demon out of them. You know why we're scared to do that? Because we're not quite sure who we are in him. We're not quite sure if we got the juice to do that. Quite frankly, some of us know we don't. They asked us a question in retreat. When's the last time you cast out a demon? You know when the last time you cast out a demon ought to have been? The last time you saw one. That's when it ought to have been. The last time you encountered one, you cast them out. We're a little bit nervous. Man, y'all getting quiet on me. Come on, that's somebody. See, I'm used to a southern church, a little more shouting, a little more, yeah, you know. You guys are pretty quiet up here in the northwest. <laughs> that's good. And we're like a sponge. Well, you got to be a sponge to live here. You'd have drowned if you wouldn't. <laughs> oh, did I say that out loud? Sorry. Greater works than these will he do. Because I go to my Father, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. What does that mean? Well, okay, it means this. When you're having a wayward child, pray. When you're having a wayward marriage, pray. When you're having financial problems, pray and follow the Scripture, and you'll get out of that. When you're having health issues, do what the Bible says. Call the elders of the church and let them anoint you in oil. Don't just call anybody. Call an elder. That's not what the Bible says. Call anybody. Just call anybody. Do you find that in Scripture? It says call an elder. Call someone that's living right, doing right, and being right. Call someone that's got the juice and let them anoint you with oil and pray over you, and you'll be healed. I don't know if we believe that or not. What's the problem? The problem is we stay in the infancy too long. We allow the flesh to be in charge more than the spirit. This cripples us and gives the devil an opportunity to set up a stronghold in your life. Paul addressed that to the Galatians. False teachers had crept into the church. Galatians chapter 1 verse 6 and 8. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you into the grace of Christ to a different gospel which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Brother, there's a lot of places preaching a contrary gospel today. And they will be accursed. Somebody help me preach this morning. There's a whole lot of gospel being preached that's not the gospel. And that's what that scripture designed to tell you. Now, a bunch of people in Galatia had gotten saved. They'd formed a church. And that's the church at Galatia right there. He's writing to the Galatian church members. He's writing to them. And false teachers had crept in among them. And they began to teach them all kind of crazy things that wasn't even in scripture. And Paul come along and said, hey, they're preaching another gospel to you. That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's another gospel. That's not what you ought to be hearing and adhering to. And then you, uh, you run down to Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. He uses a strong language to them. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly betrayed among you as crucified? And Paul wanted to know who bewitched you and made you think that crazy stuff. I'm asking you this morning, who is it that's bewitching you? Is the devil bewitching you and causing you not to believe John? Or James? That we don't cast out a demon and lay hands on the sick. And they recover. That blinded eyes aren't opened. It troubles me to see people who can't see and who can't walk i got a daughter who's in a wheelchair and can't walk. And I tell you, for 14 years, I've prayed for her every day. That troubles me. I know the deficiency is not in God. These are things I think about. 
You can hear just about anything you want to hear in a church today. Just, just keep. And a lot of people go from church to church to church to church to church just to looking. And you get all of this stuff and all of this stuff. And you have a belief system that is, wow, what? Here's your belief system right here. Here's your belief system right here. And any church that doesn't preach that needs to, I don't know, you just need to get away from it. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 says, we have the weapons to pull down strongholds. Let's read that. Let's read 4 and 5 because verse 5 will tell us what the stronghold is. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, can I ask you, do you believe that that is? And now stronghold is a fortified position to where we fight from. And you know, the adversary is good at setting up strongholds in our life and fighting us from that stronghold. Let me ask you today, what is a stronghold that he's got set up in your life right now and he's fighting from? What is that stronghold? What will you allow the, that Kairos moment? I hadn't forgotten that, that Kairos moment this morning. What is that? What will you allow the Holy Spirit to do to you today? What will you allow him to speak to you? Now let's look at verse 5 in that scripture. <clears throat> Casting down arguments, here's the, here's, here is the stronghold. Arguments and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. That is the strongholds that we have. Arguments against the Word of God. Things that because we get 60,000 thoughts a day, some of those negative things that are, that are worth thinking. You know, the enemy will make you think negative things about people. How many has ever experienced that besides me? The rest of you lying. We all have. The Bible says you're supposed to grab that thought and get rid of it. You're not supposed to entertain that. Oh, God, let me see them like you see them. Let me see them like you do, Lord. Let me look at them the way you're looking at them today. You know, God looks. He said that he would, that none should perish, but that everyone would come to salvation. Come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. He doesn't want anybody to perish on planet Earth. You know that out of this mouth used to come things like. They deserve to go to hell as bad as they've been and as much as they've hurt people. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness, is that, that is not true. No one deserves that. No one deserves that. No one deserves that. Here's how I know. The Bible says Christ suffered without the gate while we were yet, finish it, sinners. Did you know that's all people are that aren't serving God is sinners? And Jesus suffered outside the gate for them because he loved them. And I won't, mm, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Everybody say, Lord, help me. I'll be done in, in another five here, maybe. When Paul was describing that stronghold outside Corinth, he was looking at a hill that was 1,857 feet high on top of a fortress. And when he did that, he said, sometimes our strongholds will look insurmountable, but they are not. Don't let it be that way. Did you know the stronghold is found only one time in the New Testament? But that doesn't mean they don't exist. The devil is good at bombarding our minds with things that are telling us all kinds of stuff, tells us lies about ourselves and about others. He tells you lies about yourself. You can't do anything right. You're not worthy because of this and that in your life. God can't use you. You're not worthy. Nobody likes you. Everybody's talking about you. And all of that's going on in your mind. And that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and should be taken captive and cast down. Amen? Now, I know that the adversary has authored many hurts and abuses in your life. So as to keep you from fulfilling your destiny and becoming what God's called you to be. But you don't have to let him be that way. You know why he does that? He is afraid of what you'll do if you ever get loose. If you ever find out who you really are in God. If you ever have that Kairos moment. When God rearranges your life. 
If you ever come to a church service and you come tuned in and plugged in and ready to receive from God, if you come to every church service like that, you would get something. But we don't come to every church service like that. We come to some church services. Let's just be very honest. We come out of duty and obligation. We did not come to get anything. Or we didn't come expecting anything. We know we're supposed to be there and it's the right thing to do and I'm going to do what's right. But when you come with expectation, God changes who you are. Now that wasn't in my sermon notes, but that was, that was just a, a Kairos thing that the Lord gave me. The power to destroy those strongholds are within you. The Bible says the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. You ever wonder why we say that every Sunday? Because I want you to get in your spirit who you are. You're a, you're, a, you're a joint heir with Jesus Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, we may also be glorified with him. Romans chapter 8, verse 16 through 17. We have inherited power. This means that all recipients of all spiritual blessings now and in the future, we are recipients of those things. It also means we suffer sometimes. We have ordained stops in life. The Bible is just loaded with examples of men who show us how we should live. Elijah, Elisha. You know, Elijah brought a man back to life three years after he was dead. How many have ever read that? Three years after he was dead and buried, he brought a man back to life. You should go read that. It's a beautiful story in the book of Kings, Second Kings. I'm not going to tell you where because I want you to read the whole book. And there you are. Elijah had been dead for three years, buried and was rotted, nothing left but bones. A group of soldiers were out there, and one of their men died. They saw a band coming of attackers, so they didn't know what to do with the guy. They were getting ready to bury him, and they just threw him down in Elijah with an S, not a J, tomb. Elisha's tomb was there, and the Bible said when he went down into that tomb and his body touched the prophet's bones, he stood up and ran out of the tomb. But we can't do anything like that, really. Really? The band could get ready for us here. I'd appreciate it. I want to finish. There was a financial need of a woman in a town Elisha had. What had happened was her husband owed a great debt, and he died. She had no job, and she had one jar of oil in her house, and the debt came due. And God sent Elisha to that woman's house, and she told him the story. I'm in trouble. They're going to come and take my sons and put them in a debtor's prison until they pay all the money back. Elijah says, have you got anything in the house? She says, I got a jar of oil. He said, have you got any other jars? She says, I don't have any other jars. Oil was very expensive. I mean, it takes a lot of olives to make an ounce of oil. A lot. You got to do a lot of crushing. And he said, go in the neighborhood and borrow every vessel you can find. She went through the whole neighborhood, borrowed every vessel she could find. Came back and he said, now pour out of that little jar into that big jar. What? She poured out of that jar, little jar into the big jar and the big jar became full. And that jar and that jar and that jar and that jar and that jar. And, that jar, and every jar she'd borrowed. He says, you got anything else I can pour oil into? He said, now go sell this and pay your debt. You don't think God can do that for you today? Most of you do not think God can do that to you today. Your answer is let me run to the bank. Let me go borrow someone, beg someone, find something somewhere. You'll be obedient and faithful and tithing and giving and living and loving and doing what the scripture teaches you when you've got a need God will meet your need that power is in you you have a right to stand in your living room and say God this, this, is, this debt is due and I don't have the money to pay it I need help you see I, I am a, an avid reader I love to read history and I love to read books I have probably a thousand books I, I love to read so when I'm telling you stuff, I've read that. I've researched that. I've found that. I'm not making that stuff up. I have credible testimony that that is the God that we serve.
You were created with a purpose this morning. And it's time you begin to fulfill that purpose that God has ordained for your life. He ordained you for a, div- for a moment on planet earth. This is your time. From when you were born until when you die. That dash in between is how you live your life. And it's what you allow God to do in your life. Now, I believe that God's got a Kairos moment here for someone today. But you have to allow God to do that. I'm going to invite you to come and pray in this altar. And let God minister to you. But I am not going to beg you. If you want God to transform you and to change you, then let Him do that. He wants to do that. But we have to make time to allow God to bring the transformation in our life that He wants to bring. I want to please Him more than anything on this earth. I want to please Him. I want to do what He wants me to do. I want to hear His voice. This past weekend, I was so blessed to be able to hear the voice of the Lord and to hear it with clarity. That was so wonderful for me to just to hear the voice of God, just to hear Him speak to me and to give me direction for people I didn't even know and situations I didn't even know. I was just so wonderful to be able to do that. That discernment was just very alive and active. That was just such joy, such peace, and such comfort. I challenge you to find that place and let God minister in your life. Would you stand with me today? The altar's open. Anybody wants to come and pray, just set those offering pans down. You done got ahead of yourself. We ain't going to take no offering right now. We're going to pray. Just go ahead and set them down and get ready to pray. You want God to touch you? You want God to change you? The altar's open. You can come. God can minister to you and God can touch you. I see the King of glory coming on the clouds with fire. Holy shame, holy shame. I see His love and mercy. Washing over all my sin, people see, people see, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna.